Okay, let's go on to case six. Uh, the chief complaint is my legs are weak and tingly. History. The patient is a 30-year-old woman with a history of visual disturbances about five years ago in which she had a decrease in vision in her right eye. She also had an episode a year previously of double vision that resolved on its own. So over the past week, she noted an ascending numbness and tingling in her legs, followed by difficulties walking. So when you look at this history and you look at this chief complaint, you have to ask yourself, what in a 30-year-old woman can cause visual disturbances, decreased vision in one eye, an episode of double vision, numbness, tingling in the lower extremities with difficulty walking? Now, you think about, when you think about lower extremity weakness, for example, you always want to think about a cerebrovascular accident or a stroke of some sort or a tumor. However, on the boards, they're going to be asking you not what could be, but rather what is the most likely diagnosis. So when you have a young lady who presents with multiple neurologic problems over a period of time, these problems could be accounted for by several strokes. That could be. But that is not the most likely diagnosis. So in a young lady with visual disturbances five years ago, diplopia, double vision, ascending numbness and weakness over the past week, the most likely diagnosis is multiple sclerosis. Could it be other things? Absolutely. But the most likely diagnosis is multiple sclerosis. So when you see a patient, a young patient, who comes in with the history of multiple neurologic deficits separated by time and by anatomy, the most likely diagnosis is multiple sclerosis. And in fact, multiple sclerosis is the most common cause of neurologic deficit in young people. Now, I like to play a game sometimes, which is place the neurologic lesion in the central nervous system. Now, if you could take a brain tumor and place it anywhere in the brain or in the spine, would there be one place that you could place this brain tumor or this stroke that would account for all of this patient all of this patient's symptoms? And the answer is no. And that is what we mean when we make the differentiation and we say multiple sclerosis or multiple neurologic deficits separated by anatomy. That there is no one single lesion that can account for all of the neurologic deficit. There are multiple lesions all over the CNS which can, which can account for the deficit. And that's why it's called multiple sclerosis. So again, the main point in the history is multiple neurologic deficits separated by time. One occurred five years ago. One occurred a year previously. One is occurring now. But also separated by place. If there is no one lesion or one place in the CNS that can account for all of these symptoms, that is multiple sclerosis. That is multiple sclerosis. Now, what causes multiple sclerosis? You know, there is competing theories about what actually causes MS. Some people say that it's a viral infection that sort of sets off the immune system. And some people say that it's completely autoimmune. And some people say that it's a mixture of the two. That there's a viral syndrome or a viral disease that actually sets off the immune system that ultimately causes multiple sclerosis. The real answer is that we're not really sure. But it doesn't really matter for your purposes because you just need to be, re you just need to be able to recognize the fact that when a young person comes in with multiple neurologic deficits, the most likely diagnosis is multiple sclerosis, especially when those deficits are separated by time and by anatomy. By time and by anatomy, the most likely diagnosis is multiple sclerosis.
So what is the best initial test in this patient? Is the best initial test evoked potentials? Is the best initial test lumbar puncture looking for oligoclonal bands? Or is the best initial test MRI of the brain and the spine? The answer to that question is, is MRI. And the role for visual evoked potentials and lumbar puncture are primarily confirmatory. Meaning that if you do your MRI and the MRI is read as questionable, that you don't know, but clinically you have a suspicion of multiple sclerosis, you go on and you do the lumbar puncture and you look for oligoclonal banding, and you go on and you do your evoked potentials. However, the best initial test for the diagnosis of MS is MRI. And what is the most sensitive test for the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis? Again, your answer is MRI. It is the most sensitive and it is the best initial test. And the role of lumbar puncture for oligoclonal banding and visual, apo- visual evoked potentials is, is simply to confirm your findings on MRI. To confirm your findings on MRI or if the findings on MRI are not clearly and definitively consistent with demyelinating, demyelinating disease demyelinating disease. So, how do we treat multiple sclerosis? Well, we separate multiple scler- the treatment of multiple, multiple sclerosis into three basic parts. We, t- we separate mul- the treatment into treatment of the acute exacerbation, which is usually set off by a viral infection or by heat or by fatigue or stress. We treat the acute exacerbation, we treat disease progression, and we treat patients symptomatically for pain, for fatigue, pain and fatigue. Now, how do we treat patients in the acute exacerbation? The answer is steroids. Now, do we give PO or IV steroids? Now, this is the only place, multiple sclerosis is the only disease, more specifically when you're treating optic neuritis in multiple sclerosis, where you must give IV IV steroids rather than PO steroids. Because it has been shown that patients who get IV, who get PO steroids and have optic neuritis, actually have worsening of the optic neuritis. Whereas the IV improves their symptoms. Now, IV steroids will make the acute exacerbation shorter, will improve the symptoms transiently and acutely. Do steroids affect disease progression? The answer is no. Steroids will not arrest the progression of the disease. Steroids will simply reduce, improve the patient symptomatically during an acute exacerbation and will shorten the duration of the exacerbation. And when a patient has optic neuritis, you must give IV steroids and not PO. We treat patients symptomatically. Now, what kind of symptoms do patients with multiple sclerosis get? They get fatigue. Any patient with a neurologic disease that affects the strength of his muscles can get fatigue. And how do we treat fatigue and multiple sclerosis? The answer on the boards is amantadine. So patients with MS who come in with fatigue get amantadine. And what other kind of symptoms do they get secondary to the multiple sclerosis? Well, do patients with MS have upper motor neuron lesions or lower motor neuron lesions? The answer is that they have upper motor neuron lesions, which means they get increased tone in their muscles, they get spasticity, they get pain because of the increased tone and the increased spasticity. So what do we give them to relieve their pain? We give them muscle relaxants, relaxants like baclofen and dantrolene. Baclofen and dantrolene. So for their pain, we give them muscle relaxants. For their fatigue, we give them amantadine. For their acute exacerbation, we will give them We will give them steroids. Now, is there any medication that will arrest the progression of the disease? The answer is yes. There are three medications that will arrest progression. 
Those are interferon beta 1A, interferon beta 1B, and glatoramer acetate. Now, is there any difference between those three medications? Meaning, do patients who get interferon beta 1B have better results than those patients who get interferon beta 1A or glatoramer acetate? The answer is no. So if on the boards they ask you a question about a patient who has progressive MS, whether it's secondary progressive disease or primary progressive disease, and you want to give the patient a medication that will arrest the progression of the disease, the answer is either interferon beta 1A, interferon beta 1B, or glatoramer acetate, but it will not be all of those. They will not ask you to choose between those three medications because there is no evidence that one of, these, one, med, one of these medications is better than the other one for the arrest or for the ret- retardation of progression. If they ask you about fatigue and MS, you're looking for amantadine. If they're asking you about pain, you're looking for baclofen or dantrolene. If they're asking you about treatment of the acute exacerbation, you're looking for steroids. And if there is evidence of optic neuritis, you're going to give IV steroids, or you're always going to give IV steroids for the exacerbation of MS rather than PO steroids or oral steroids. So in summary, patients who are young, who come in with multiple, multiple neurologic deficit, separated by time and anatomy, the most likely diagnosis is multiple sclerosis. The best initial test for the diagnosis is MRI. The most sensitive test is MRI. How do we treat MS? To arrest disease progression, we give interferon beta 1A, interferon beta 1B, or glatoramer acetate. To treat the acute exacerbation, we give steroids, and to treat the symptoms, for fatigue we will give amantadine, for pain we will give muscle relaxants like baclofen. Let's go on to the next, well, let's go to the physical exam. She has pale disc on the right eye with color desaturation, consistent with optic neuritis. She has increased reflexes in the lower extremities with the positive Babinski, These are all upper motor neuron signs consistent with multiple demyelinating disease, multiple lesions in her white matter throughout her CNS. Let's go on to the next case. Okay, case number seven. Chief complaint. I can't walk. Patient is a 42-year-old man who developed ascending weakness in the lower extremities accompanied by paresthesias following a recent episode of gastroenteritis. Weakness has increased over the last week to the point where he cannot walk. So what is the most likely diagnosis in this particular case? The answer is Guillain-Barre syndrome. Now, when you're looking at questions on the USMLE, you have to be able to distinguish based upon the history between Guillain-Barre disease, botulism, and myasthenia. Because these are all diseases that will give you muscle weakness and could compromise your respiratory function. So how do I differentiate between Guillain-Barre, myasthenia, and botulism? Well, botulism will have a history of ingesting the toxin. So patients who come in with a history of eating home canned food, or if the patient is a child, has a history of, of eating honey, and have a sudden onset of flaccid paralysis, the most likely diagnosis is botulism. Patients who have a history where the paralysis is diplopia, cranial nerve deficits, difficulty swallowing, and a history of eating home canned food, or if the patient is a child eating honey, the most likely diagnosis is botulism. 
Myasthenia, again, we had the case previously where the patient has weakness that's worse over the course of a day with no history of toxin ingestion. So without a history of toxin ingestion, weakness, diplopia, ocular paralysis, dysphagia, dysarthria, over the, that gets worse over the course of a day, the most likely diagnosis is myasthenia gravis. So what characterizes Guillain-Barre? Well, Guillain-Barre is characterized by the location of the weakness. In Guillain-Barre, we don't have weakness in the eyes, in the throat, or difficulty swallowing. The weakness starts in the legs and will go up and will be ascending. So if a patient has ascending weakness as opposed to diplopia, dysphagia, so on, especially if that ascending weakness is accompanied by paresthesias and follows an acute episode of gastroenteritis, the most likely diagnosis is Guillain-Barre. Guillain-Barre. And again, in patients with Guillain-Barre, we have to be concerned about their respiratory status. If they have an ascending weakness, we have to be concerned that the weakness may affect their diaphragm and their ability and their ability to breathe effectively, to maintain an appropriate tidal volume may be compromised. So again, Guillain-Barre is differentiated on history by gastroenteritis, paresthesias, and an ascending weakness, an ascending weakness. Botulism, you're looking for a history of toxin ingestion. Myasthenia, the weakness worsens and is worse later in the day. And just by looking at the history, you can get a good idea and you can differentiate between these three diseases. Now, how do we treat Guillain-Barre? Do we give steroids for Guillain-Barre, Guillain-Barre syndrome? And the answer is no, we don't. Because steroids in acute Guillain-Barre can actually worsen the symptoms. And that is different, that is different than myasthenia gravis, where, where we give steroids as part of our immunosuppressive therapy. So in acute Guillain-Barre, you never give steroids, but in myasthenia, you give steroids. So how do we treat Guillain-Barre? We treat Guillain-Barre by plasmapheresis, by IV immunoglobulin, but we do not give steroids in acute Guillain-Barre. Sometimes Guillain-Barre can develop into a chronic disorder. And if, patient ha- if a patient has a chronic Guillain-Barre, you can give steroids. So myasthenia is different than Guillain-Barre in that in Guillain-Barre we don't give steroids and myasthenia we do. And we only give steroids in Guillain-Barre if it is chronic and not acute. How do we treat Guillain-Barre? Intravenous immunoglobulin and plasmapheresis. How do we make the diagnosis? Is there an imaging study that we can use to make a diagnosis of Guillain-Barre? And the answer is no. We make the diagnosis because there is a characteristic profile on the CSF pathogen. Most of the time, when you have high protein in the CSF, the high protein is accompanied by a high cell count. Cells are sort of, you know, little little bullets of protein, little po- protein pellets. So if the cell count goes up, your protein in the CSF should also go up. However, in Guillain-Barre, it is characteristic that as the pro- even though the protein level is elevated, the cell count remains low. So if you have a 42-year-old man who has a sending weakness following a gastroenteritis with paresthesias and you do a lumbar puncture and there is an elevation of the protein but no elevation of the cell count, the diagnosis is Guillain-Barre syndrome. You do not treat Guillain-Barre with steroids, but rather you treat with IV 
intravenous immunoglobulin or plasmapheresis. Or plasmapheresis. Let's go on to the next case. So a physical exam is a flaccid paralysis, no ankle jerks, consistent with a lower motor neuron deficit because it's a peripheral neuropathy and there's a mild sensory disturbance. You do the lumbar puncture, there is an elevated protein with no concomitant elevation of the, of the, of the cell count, and that is the diagnosis of Guillain-Barre. Again, in any patient who has weakness, whether it's secondary to myasthenia, whether it's secondary to botulism, whether it's secondary to Guillain-Barre, it is very, very important it is very important to measure the vital capacity and follow the vital capacity to determine whether the patient needs intubation or does not need, does not need intubation. So let's go on to the next case. Case 8. Chief complaint. Patient presents with a loss of consciousness. The patient is a 28-year-old man who was working on a construction site when friends noted his arms started jumping, then noted facial twitching, and then loss of consciousness with tonic-clonic movements. patient has no memory of this, but does recount a previous episode of his hand jumping out of control. He denies IV drug use, but has used cocaine and marijuana on a regular basis. He denies head trauma. He does not have sex with men but he is paid for sex with women. So what is the most likely diagnosis in this particular case? This is a 28-year-old man who was working on a construction site, had his arms start jumping, his face began then twitching, and then he lost consciousness with tonic-clonic movements. Just from that history, it sounds like a seizure. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. How do you differentiate between seizure and syncope? Seizure and syncope, just based on the history. Now, you may say, seizure may give me tonic-clonic movements, but syncope will not. But if you would say such a thing, you would be incorrect. In fact, patients who syncopize can have seizure-like activity. So what on history will actually differentiate seizure from syncope? The answer is the duration of the post ictal state. Patients who have seizures will take a long time to come out of, the, to come out of their, their episode, of, their, of, 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 of their, their, their seizure episode. They'll have a seizure, they'll be very tired, very slow moving, sort of out of it for a half an hour or an hour. Patients who syncopize will have syncope and will get better much more quickly. So just based upon the history, you look for tonic-clonic movements, but you also look for how quickly the patient comes out of, how quickly the patient comes out of his seizure-like activity. If the patient's having a seizure, he will have a long or an extended post-ictal state. Syncope, the post-ictal state, or the post-event state, tends to be much shorter. Also, loss of bowel, loss of bladder, tongue lacerations consistent with seizure imply that the patient has seizure. Now, it's very important that when you have a patient on the boards who presents with seizure-like activity, that you consider seizure to be a symptom. Seizure does not equal epilepsy. Seizure does not equal one specific diagnosis, but rather seizure is something, is a symptom, or is a sign, or is an indication that there may be many things going on, and you have to consider a wide differential. What is the basic differential for seizure that you have to consider? Metabolic causes of seizure. Things like hyponatremia, hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia can all give you seizure. Hypoxia can give you seizure. 
anatomic or structural causes of seizure, like acute intracranial bleeding, brain tumor, stroke, infectious causes of seizure, like meningitis, encephalitis, brain abscess. These are all things that you have to consider when making a diagnosis and determining how you're going to manage these patients. And that's all part of the workup. The part of the workup on this patient is going to be a CT scan. Why? Because I'm looking for a structural lesion that could have caused a seizure. I'm looking for an abscess. I'm looking for a brain tumor. Is there an intracranial bleed? I'm going to check the patient's electrolytes. Why? Because I'm looking for hyponatremia, hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia. I'm going to check an ABG because I'm looking for hypoxia as a cause of this gentleman's seizure. Now, what on his history may imply the diagnosis here? It's in the last line. This is a gentleman who does not have sex with men, but he has paid for sex with women. What does that put him at risk for? HIV. Well, everybody's at risk for HIV, but particularly him. He's at particular risk for HIV. Because apparently he has unprotected sex. And in a patient with HIV with a focal neurologic deficit, or a patient who has a risk of HIV with a focal neurologic deficit and seizure, the most likely diagnosis is what? Toxoplasmosis. Now, how do we differentiate between toxoplasmosis and CNS lymphoma? The answer is, is that if you have an isolated lesion in the brain, it's much less likely to be toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasmosis will give you multiple ring-enhancing lesions in, on your CT. An abscess tends to be one abscess, or one focal lesion. Lymphoma will also tend to be multiple rather than singular, but can be singular. So we look at the physical exam, and this is a patient who has a focal physical exam. He has a facial droop, he has a pronator drift, he has increased tone, he has hyperreflexia with a positive Babinski, and risk factors for HIV. Differential diagnosis, seizure with Todd's paralysis. Does he have epilepsy? Well, the fact that he has a focal neurologic exam speaks against epilepsy or idiopathic seizure disorder as a cause of his particular problem. Does he have a stroke? I don't know. I'm going to get a CT scan and see. Does he have an AVM causing a seizure? Again, a structural lesion causing seizure activity. Does he have a brain tumor or does he have a metabolic cause of seizure? Again, in our initial diagnostic plan, we are ruling out all these possible causes by checking the electrolytes, toxicology screen. We're getting a CT scan with and without contrast. And in our CT scan, we find a ring-enhancing lesion. So at this point in the case, the most likely diagnosis is toxoplasmosis, simply because this is a gentleman who has risk factors for HIV. This could be a, an abscess. This could be CNS lymphoma. It could be a brain tumor. But if, he ha if this patient turns out to be HIV positive, the most likely diagnosis is toxoplasmosis. Now, how do we treat toxoplasmosis? Generally, patients who come in who are HIV positive and have ring-enhancing lesions of the brain we assume that they have toxoplasmosis and we treat them for two to four weeks for their toxoplasmosis and we look at the size of the lesions. And if lesions shrink after being treated for toxoplasmosis, we continue treatment and we avoid a brain biopsy. If, however, the lesions do not shrink after being treated for toxoplasmosis, we have to go for a brain biopsy 
to find out what those lesions are and to make a definitive diagnosis because if it is CNS lymphoma, we need a tissue diagnosis before we can start chemotherapy. How do we treat toxoplasmosis? We give pyrimethamine and sulfadiazine. Sulfadiazine with pyrimethamine. Now, if a patient is sulfa-allergic, we give clindamycin instead of the sulfadiazine. Again, HIV-positive patient comes in with multiple ring-enhancing lesions in the brain. Treat empirically for, with, for toxoplasmosis for two to four weeks with pyrimethamine and sulfadiazine. If the patient is sulfoallergic, you give clindamycin instead of the sulfadiazine. You measure the size of the lesions after treating for two to four weeks. If they shrink, you continue treatment. If there is no shrinkage, you must go for a biopsy to make a tissue diagnosis before you can treat for CNS lymphoma. Before you can treat for CNS lymphoma. Now, if you have a patient who comes in with an acute seizure, what is the first step in the management of that patient? The answer is that you have to address your ABCs. By ABCs, I mean airway, breathing, circulation. You must ensure that this patient has a sufficient airway. And that, in recurrent seizure, requires, may require intubation. You must consider breathing. Is the patient's oxygen status being compromised by his seizure? Or does the seizure appear to be resolving? And what is his circulatory status? Only after you've considered your ABCs can you consider treatment. Now, what is the first medication you use for a seizure? The answer is lorazepam. You give lorazepam IV. You can give lorazepam or you can give diazepam. You give lorazepam IV. If the patient continues to seize through the benzodiazepine, you have to add phenytoin. If the patient continues to seize through the phenytoin, then you add the phenobarbital. Then you add the phenobarbital. Now, in this particular case, the patient had a seizure, but is not continuing to seize. The patient doesn't seem to be going into status epilepticus. So you can load this patient orally with phenytoin, and you don't have to treat them acutely. However, if this patient was having a seizure and did not regain his mental status and had another seizure and did not regain his mental status and is continuing to seize without regaining his mental status between seizures, that is what is defined as status epilepticus. And, that is, and how do you treat status epilepticus with this uh, uh, increasing level of medication? You start with lorazepam. You add the phenytoin IV loading because he's acutely seizing. If the patient continues to seize, you continue to give the, phenobar you give the phenobarbital. So for status epilepticus, it's lorazepam or diazepam. IV loading with phenytoin, continuing to seizing, continuing to seize, you add the phenobarbital. If the patient continues to seize despite the phenobarbital, you add, despite the phenobarbital, you add midazolam which is IV benzodiazepine or propofol. So you have this workup of medications that you use to treat status epilepticus. In our particular case here, this is a patient who doesn't have status epilepticus. Because he had his seizure, he seems to have recovered from his seizure. So this is not considered to be a neurologic em emergency. Now you see on the CT scan here a nice ring-enhancing lesion consistent with toxoplasmosis or brain abscess. Treatment plan we went over. Okay, let's go on to the next test, the next case. Now the main point with the seizure case was that don't consider a seizure to be epilepsy. Consider a seizure to be a symptom. They can be caused by many, many, many things. 
And if you have a seizure with hyponatremia or hypocalcemia or hypomagnesemia, you treat the underlying cause before you assume that the seizure is due to idiopathic epilepsy. Okay, let's go on to case nine. Chief complaint. Right hand weakness and decreased verbal output. The patient is a 56-year-old woman with a history of smoking, adult onset diabetes, and high blood pressure. Her husband became, cons- became concerned when his wife dropped the plate on the floor. Though usually quite verbal, she had difficulty expressing her thoughts. He was unable to understand what she was saying, so he gave her a pen and pad, but she could only write a couple of words that didn't make much more sense than her speech. He immediately brought his wife to the emergency room, but her symptoms resolved on the way. So if you remember back to our case of CVA, the presentation is very, very similar. Similar. You have an elderly person with the risk factors for atherosclerotic disease, smoking, adult onset diabetes, and high blood pressure, who has a sudden onset of focal neurologic deficit. In this particular case, right hand weakness and decreased verbal output. So when you see the situation, acute onset of focal neurologic deficit with the risk factors for atherosclerotic disease, the most likely diagnosis is cerebrovascular accident. Now what is the difference between this case and our case of CVA? Well, if you look at the history, you see that in her particular case, the onset of the neurologic deficit was acute, but was transient. Did not last for a long time. By the time she got to the hospital, her neurologic deficit had completely resolved. And what is this characteristic of? This is characteristic of something called a transient ischemic attack. What's the difference between a TIA and a CVA? Classically, by definition, TIAs are focal neurologic deficits of acute onset that resolve within 24 hours. If the, if the focal neurologic deficit does not resolve or, or continues past 24 hours, it's automatically considered to be a CVA, or cerebrovascular accident. The way I like to think of TIAs is basically unstable angina of the brain. There's a patient who has an acute coronary syndrome, has a non-Q-wave MI, or a, an MI which is not transmural, but is at a higher risk for recurrent MI and for complete infarction. So too in the brain. TIA is unstable angina of the brain. They have a higher risk of complete of a complete stroke. And in fact, our workup and our treatment is to prevent the complete stroke when it occurs. Or is to prevent the complete stroke from occurring. So the workup is very much the same. This is a lady who has right upper extremity weakness and decreased verbal output. This is anterior circulation symptoms. She's not presenting with vertigo. She's not presenting with perioral numbness. She's not presenting with syncope. She's presenting with focal neurologic deficit and aphasia. It's anterior circulation. And when we talk about anterior circulation, we talk about the carotid arteries. We talk about an embolic source in the heart. We talk about atrial fibrillation as a source of emboli for the CVA. And the workup is exactly the same. We're going to get a halter monitor for 24 hours. We're going to do an EKG. We're going to do an echocardiogram. And if the patient has anterior circulation signs or symptoms from their TIA, we're going to get a carotid duplex to look for symptomatic occlusions greater than 70%, which would be an indication for carotid endarterectomy.
How do we treat these patients medically? We treat them with aspirin. If patients are having TIAs on aspirin, what do we add? We enhance our antiplatelet therapy with clopidogrel and not to clopidine because the side effect pro- profile of clopidogrel is much better than to clopidine. So again, the difference between a TIA and a CVA is simply the duration is simply the duration of the neurologic deficit. If the neurologic deficit lasts less than 24 hours, then it's defined as a TIA. If it lasts greater than 24 hours, it's defined as a CVA. Now, classically, patients with TIAs won't have symptoms that will resolve after 12 hours or 13 hours or 14 hours. Classically, their symptoms will resolve under an hour. 15 minutes, 20 minutes, they have a neurologic deficit, and then it will get better. And in fact, if a patient has a neurologic deficit which lasts more than an hour, even though classically we cannot call it a CVA until the neurologic deficit extends beyond the 24-hour period, patients who have TIAs who have deficits that last more than an hour, 85% of those patients will actually go on to a full CVA. So even if a patient has a deficit that lasts more than an hour, they're more likely than not to have a full stroke. But the classic definition or the classic cutoff point is 24 hours. So on physical exam, she has a blood pressure of 180 over 100, pulse of 100. A loud brewery was auscultated over the left carotid artery, no murmurs, and the neurologic exam was non-focal. She had her deficit, and the deficit got better, usually within 15, 20 minutes or an hour. If it extends beyond an hour, 85% of the time, the patient will extend to a full-blown CIA, CVA. Again, on history, she has risk factors for atherosclerotic disease, which makes you think of TIA or CVA. So here, after we do our carotid Doppler, we find that there's a greater than 70% stenosis of the left internal carotid artery. Now, is that stenosis symptomatic? In this particular case, it is because she's complaining of right arm weakness. So in this particular case, there would be evidence or there would be an indication for carotid endarterectomy because this patient is having, is having symptomatic, symptomatic stenosis of her internal carotid artery, which would be an indication for carotid endarterectomy. Now, what is the best initial test on the boards for carotid artery disease? The answer is duplex, carotid Doppler. What is the most sensitive test? The answer is either angiography or MR angiogram. Now, if they give you angiography and MR angiogram, you will answer MRA because MRA is less invasive and the results are comparable to angiography. Again, the best initial diagnostic test for carotid artery disease is the duplex or Doppler. The most sensitive test is angiography or MRA. And if they give you MRA and angiography and ask you about the most sensitive test or the best test, you will go for MRA because it is non-invasive because it is non-invasive okay let's take a break and go on to the next test that the next case